Hi guys, I'm here at Red Fern Farm with Andy in beautiful Floyd, Virginia, and we're excited to be giving you guys a tour of their operation. It's really neat to see what you guys have accomplished over the last four or five years here developing this farm. And so let's, uh, let's take a tour and, and show everybody what you guys are doing. Great. So yeah. Love to show you around. Yeah, so right here is kind of where it all started, right? Yeah, definitely. So right here, uh, we had, I think we had about 40 or so beds, um, 30 foot wide beds, kind of that no-till market garden style. Uh -huh. um, it was all open field uh, and we just kind of put that into production, kind of eked our way in, kind of got into it, you know, very unintentionally we wanted to start a small homestead and I yeah. just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I started doing more research about profitability and what to grow and how to seed it and all those things. You know, I didn't grow up with an agricultural background, so it was all foreign and new to me. And so as I was building out the beds and kind of doing that research, I just kept on doing more and okay. more and more. Um, so when we first started, we were probably at about, I don't know, maybe a 12th of an acre, 10th to a 12th of an acre, all open field. Um, and this is where it all started. So was the original goal just kind of a homestead or were you planning on doing market gardening as well? Uh, the original goal was just a homestead, actually. Okay. So right. we, uh, we moved from suburbia out here uh -huh. and uh, we just wanted uh, more space and room for our daughters to grow and run some free air and not hear the noise from the traffic and all that. Um, so that was the initial plan. Um, but my personality and the way I am, everything just has to be bigger and better and just <laughs> build and build and build. I'm a, I'm yeah. a builder. Yeah. Um, and so it was just natural for me to want to go bigger. Yeah. And um, eventually, you know, I saw the light like, well, this is actually profitable it's scalable and profitable. You can, you can make good money doing this. Um, you know, my family didn't grow up doing farming. Like I didn't know, like mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a farmer actually. When I grew up, like that's what I wanted to be. I was like, mom, what do you want to be? I'm like, oh, I want to be a farmer. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't know how to do that. How do you yeah. become a farmer? So there's always been a, a, an interest there, but yeah. when you moved out here, it, it really kind of sparked that interest. It sounds yeah, like it just ignited yeah. a fire and it's, it's been great. Cool. Well, let's get started over here. So you were telling me this is your was your first um, caterpillar tunnel that you built, and yep. it kind of was a springboard for the the growth. Yeah. So after our first season, we decided to go with a caterpillar tunnel. We had heard about growing undercover and how awesome it was, and um, so I was like, "Well, I'll give it a try." Yeah. And it made a world of difference. So this is tunnel one. It's our first tunnel. So it's uh, four years old now. It's all original plastic. We made some, some modifications. Obviously we put the end walls on. Um, we have some louvers on the top. We had to put in this fencing um, to keep the rabbits out because we grow a lot of lettuce. They come in here and it's really, they're really pesky. So it keeps the rabbits out. Uh, if we put it down low enough, when the chickens were getting out, they'd jump in here and kind of scratch around. So we okay. to keep it as clean as possible. So it keeps it low enough. Um, but yeah, this is the tunnel. So we have the overhead irrigation that we run in the uh, summertime when we're not doing like trellis crops and okay. things that don't mind like lettuce can help keep it cool mm -hmm. um, but we're running drip only drip right now because we have the flowers and the flowers can't get the water on the petals it's a lot of yeah. damage okay so when you're running the overhead in the summer do you run it like for short bursts throughout the day to kind of keep the evaporative cooling effect or is it yeah okay. yeah so we'll do if we're going to do a, if we're going through a really long hot dry spell we'll do it like a heavy in the in the middle of the night just okay. to like soak it in and then there'll be a lot of like short bursts overhead okay um and we kind of actually do that with our drip too so we do a pulse irrigation so instead of doing like a really deep watering um it's a lot of sporadic really small doses of water and it helps saturate the soil a lot more use a lot less water okay um and the plants love it interesting so do you have that on a timer system where you don't have to be manually turning it on and off yeah so we've kind of buttoned everything up to these these manifolds here and we okay. have two zones and so like right now we have the overhead zone turned off so it okay. can't go on i um, mean everything is running on drip okay and then we have it set up so that when it's winter time we can just turn those lines everything drains out um, we have relief valves in between the tunnels so all because the the main line is um four feet down uh -huh. and the frost free hydrants but everything else here is maybe like three inches which is gonna freeze gonna freeze so yeah. we drain everything out and everything yep. just kind of flows out okay great that's a really a really neat system you have there i like how you've added the roll-up sides on your on your tunnels that is a definitely a quality of life improvement yeah it, it definitely makes it a, lot, a lot nicer when i'm not having to get wet and soggy in the morning so quick yeah. turn and, and there we go and then the insect netting is something you said you'd added um which has helped reduce bugs but you were you were mentioning 
with like crops like eggplant, even seeing like significant yield increases with that. Yeah. So the first year we grew eggplant, we grew it in antenna one and we started it under protect net. And then when we took it off, uh, we, we got a yield, but the, the flea beetle pressure was really, really intense and we, it just was not great. So the next year we put it in this tunnel, this is tunnel two, and we put it under protect net again. When it started to flower, it needed to pollinate. We took the protect net off. Um, we had beneficials inside and then with the, uh, double protection, right? So we have the screen here. Uh -huh. It really made a, a huge difference. The yield increase was amazing. I think it's just because the health of the plants, right? They okay. didn't have to compete with so much pest pressure. Yeah. Interesting. Talk for a minute about the landscape fabric that you've put down between your tunnels. I think that's a really smart move that I see a lot of people um, forget about that during their build out. Um, has that been really beneficial? Yeah, um, it's been amazing. I don't have to weed eat or mow or anything down there. It's nice and clean. Um, it's permeable, right? So all the water that kind of sheds off goes down the slope. It goes right through. So it hasn't mm -hmm. been an issue at all. Um, you know, when we put our first tunnel in, we didn't put the weed fabric in and weed eating around the tunnel. I hated it. It was yeah. a chore. It was yeah. not good for the plastic and the ropes. And so when I put in the next tunnels, I was like, well, we're going to put the fabric down. We're going to eliminate that problem. And it saved a ton of time. Yeah. It's, it's, Great. And the, you were also mentioning like the weed encroachment, like not only do you not have to worry about weed eating and stuff like that, but the, the beds next to the edge, you don't have issues with weeds encroaching in. Yeah. It, that makes a huge difference. Like rhizomial grasses and stuff like that. They shoot in yeah. right underneath those, those kickboards. And so on tunnel one, we don't have it on the far side and we get that pressure. Mm -hmm. But on this side here where we put the fabric down, there is no issues, no issues at all. So it That's makes great. a huge difference. This is um, tunnel three. We just put our tomatoes in uh, two days ago. We've had some cold nights, so they're sitting under row cover here. We have them flanked with onions on this side and lettuce on this side. Um, and so we're using the trellis system here and we use the, the hook system here, the clipper system. And so we started with the roller hooks. Well, we started, I guess, the field grill. And we had, you know, a pole trellis with twine. Um, and we immediately, you know, realized that growing under cover with tomatoes is is a game changer yeah like you get a lot less disease pressure they love the heat like they don't like the the water on their leaves and it's it's awesome yeah so we started growing tomatoes only in the tunnel um in the roller hooks it was just kind of a pain to get up there and and adjust them and lower them down and lean them um, mm -hmm. so you can get the maximum uh, production out of that that vine um so we started or to use the clipper system and it's an expensive initial investment but I don't have to get up on a ladder. I can just move it. Yeah. There's no string aside from that very first little bit that you have to get the, the plant trained to the actual um, hook. But I mean, it's, it's just great. Yeah, that's the yeah. way to go. Yeah. Cool. Is all of your production here um, managed with hand tools? Yeah. So everything, um, the tractor that we have is really for mowing the grass. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and maybe flipping or moving some compost around. But most of what we do is with hand tools, wheelbarrows, and that sort of thing. So you have a, a tool wall here that's mm -hmm. very centralized and it looks like you just have very basic hand tools like the broad fork, rakes. Yeah, so I mean, I try and keep it as simple as possible. I think the more tools you have, the more complex and convoluted things are going to be and mm -hmm. trying to keep it simple has made it easy for me. Like yeah. the less I have to figure out, like if I just have it, it's it's way easier. Yes, yeah, super simple tools, a couple hard rakes, the broad fork, um, shovels, stirrup hose, the wire weeder. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what stays out here. We mm -hmm. have some other tools um, in the basement, kind of with the wash pack and, and the, the planting and the, and the harvesting and whatnot. But this is just the hard tools that we use for, for the farm. You do all your direct seeding with a jang? Yes, all the direct seedings with the jang. Okay. You got some beautiful salad mix coming up. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is what's left of our outdoor veg growing space. Um, so garlic, spinach, this is a, a greens mix. Um, we have baby kale and black radishes followed by some, some uh, encore lettuce mix. And then the far two beds will actually be dahlias this year. I like the rocks for holding down the netting. <laughs> we have Are these all rocks that you pulled out of the garden space? <laughs> From the garden space or, or the, uh, the edge of the creek? Yeah, so yeah. we... It's That's the creative. creek flat right here. So as we're kind of moving stuff around and building beds, we unearth a lot of these quartz boulders. Yeah. Those are heavy too. Oh yeah. So you do all overhead irrigation out here? Yeah. So all overhead, the dahlias are going to be drip uh, this year. The first year when we first did outside, we did drip by the tomatoes because okay. I knew they didn't like 
getting wet. Yeah. You know, it can't stop the rain, but as much as we can, we want to manage that water. But everything out here is now overhead. Okay. And the fencing you have around here was necessary for deer, you said, and then yeah. uh, rabbits and stuff like that, I guess. Yeah. So have you found this plastic netting to be effective? Yes and no. Okay. Um, so it's effective against deer. Uh, if you notice around the bottom, we have wood baseboards it's because the rabbits were chewing holes through the plastic fencing and coming uh, in. Okay. And so we had to put that wood baseboard up to prevent the rabbits from coming in. Um, and so this tunnel here, this is our newest tunnel. You can see there's no border on the side. So mm -hmm. like tunnel one, this one will also be an open tunnel, but it is going to have that rabbit fencing along the base because rabbits have kind of come in and decimated our levit lettuce. Yeah, that's unfortunate. We initially started over here on this veg side. There's about a 10th of an acre, give or take. Um, and we wanted, to, I wanted to expand. Um, and this used to be all just nice open grass, mowed grass. We could run in here and play or whatever. Um, and I convinced uh, Vanessa to let me open some plots out here. So we laid down silage tarp um, and killed the grass. And we put in 10 beds, 10 50 foot beds over here um, our first year. And I decided that um, I was gonna go flowers. So there's no irrigation over here. So I was like, I can't grow a lot of the the greens that require a ton of irrigation that I'm growing on the veg side. So over here, I was like, well, what can we grow? There's some dry farm stuff that we can do. So we do squash, zucchini, we did sweet potatoes, potatoes, um, and then we're gonna do flowers. So we did flowers, we started putting them in, and Vanessa really got into the flowers. She would help out a ton on the farm, but I could never like get that pull into it. Mm -hmm. um, like I kind of have that drive. Um, but I feel like as soon as we put the flowers in and she started working with the flowers and seeing the colors and building the bouquets, she was hooked. So we had these initial 10 beds and I was like, well, what if we expand again? And she was like, okay. And you can expand even more than I was anticipating expanding. Mm -hmm. So I was going to be at 10 beds. I was going to add another 10 beds. And so, but now we're, we're at a total of, I think 28 over here. Plus we're still expanding. It's beautiful. So 28 beds that are going to be all for flowers. Mostly flowers. So we'll still have a couple dry farm veggies over here. So we'll do okra, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, a couple of them, but most of the production over here is flowers. Okay. And what's your major markets for the flowers? So we sell direct to consumer for the most part at the farmer's market. Um, we have a couple of custom order bouquets um, that we'll make and we're kind of dabbling in some wedding work. And so we've um, gotten some folks to come and reach out to us and say, hey, love your flowers. Would you be interested in doing our wedding? And so we're kind of, this year we really kind of leaned into that. And when okay. we were selecting varieties and colors and palettes and kind of thinking about it, we thought about weddings and kind of what people are looking for instead of those bright, crazy like zinnias and all the crazy colors that is like really catch your eye at the farmer's market. We are looking at like muted peachy pink tones and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that when we get to the wedding season, you know, got we got it. For people. Yeah. yeah, that's neat. Cool. And uh, what percentage of the revenue comes from flowers? Um, so this is our second year with flowers. Um, the first year, flowers made up approximately a third of our revenue from the farm off of 10 beds versus, you know, I think we end up, I forget what we have on the far side, but I mean, it was a third. Mm -hmm. it was, I mean, it's a significant amount. And so it made sense to me, like, do we expand? Yeah, we can expand. Yeah. We can expand with flowers. That's great. Yeah. I like how you're doing the, the live pathways, but yet on the bed tops you have, um, landscape fabric so you don't have to be fighting weeds constantly in your beds yeah and, and that was that was important to us like i didn't want to have to weed over here you know we both work full-time jobs so like managing this much more farm was going to be crazy and so i yeah. wanted to manage the weeds as best i could and i knew that that was taking a ton of my time mm -hmm. so landscape fabric was honestly the only way here um, so it does serve a couple purposes one is that weed management but two, because this side is dry farm, so we don't irrigate, it really helps hold in the moisture when you add the compost underneath. And so, because we don't have to irrigate, the moisture retention is really key with this fabric. Yeah. You mentioned a second ago, just briefly, that you guys both work full-time jobs off the farm. Expound on that a little bit, because I think that a lot of people would be ex inspired by the fact that you have this scale of an operation, but still working full-time off the farm. I know that takes a tremendous amount of commitment for you guys, but um, you know, how do you do that? It's, it's a lot of work. A lot of it's communication and teamwork, um, kind of know each other's rhythm and, and how things function. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we're just shy of a half an acre right now. And um, she works you know, like 
12 hour shifts at the local hospital and I work, you know, nine to five uh, at a local university, got to get my kids to school earlier and, and, mm -hmm. and later. So, I mean, much of our day, we're not here attending. So a lot of it is early morning, we're getting up, harvesting, transplanting. Um, then we take the kids and get them ready for school. We go to work and then in the evening time, we take the kids, do their homework, uh, get them all squared away for bed. And then we come out and, and do the seating. You know, during the school year, it's really hard. The summer it breaks a little bit because we yeah. have a little more flexibility in the morning. You know, I don't have to be at work until nine. So I have another hour to play in the morning uh, in the summertime. But yeah, I can get pretty hectic. And how, how do you manage your markets? Do you have weekday markets? So we have a Saturday market. So we have a, one market on Saturday um, and we do an online store. So people are able to order online and then come pick up on the farm on Sunday when we're home. Sunday, okay. we try and make our rest day as much as we yeah. can. Our family day, we'll go down to the creek, go fishing, go mm -hmm. tubing in the creek, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but we try and maintain some type of family day as best we can. Well, that's neat. It's really neat to see the operation that you guys are, are growing here. And I hope that one day it gets to the point where you can commit to this full time and, and take the leap of cutting ties with the day job. Yeah. I know that would be exciting. That's the dream. Well, before we wrap up, why don't you give us a tour of your wash pack area and, yeah. and your pr propagation stuff as well. Yeah, come on in. So currently we're in our, our basement. So we have grand visions of putting a pole barn in with proper wash pack and kind of like some educational classroom stuff. But right now we're in the basement. Cool. We're making do with what we have. Um, so we've built a, a greens bubbler. So basically the, the process is we'll harvest everything from the field, um, greens wise. And if we can't wash it right away, we'll go into the walk-in cooler. Um, but we'll wash. We modified the washing machine to, to spin everything, mm -hmm. spin it dry. We dump it out onto this screen here. We have fans on the top. If it doesn't get dry enough, we'll run it for a little bit to dry them off. But we can kind of go through the greens really quick here, pick out anything that's not looking good mm -hmm. or some weeds that might have gone in or something like that. It goes out to this table here where we weigh everything, bag it up. We'll throw it into a cooler, which goes into the walk-in cooler for market, or we'll go back into the tote and uh, then we'll be ready for market. So this is kind of that lay, just kind of a straight line, trying to make an assembly line, everything as quick as possible. Yeah, that's great. And you have a walk-in cooler. So we got really used, the compressor wasn't working. So again, we worked it with the cool bot. And so then we just built these shelves so we can do eggs and flowers. And then on this side here, we can stack up all the veg and, and the produce and tubs. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, wow, it is pretty small. Yeah, it's super but, small. You know, you maximize the space and it you looks do like what you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So that's the cooler. Um, seed starting again, we don't have a, a nursery set up yet. Uh, so we do seed starting down here. We have two racks and then we have one more rack upstairs. We'll probably end up doing a fourth here. We just do all the propagation starting in here, move them outside, harden them off, and then transplant them outside. Great. So you have to use all artificial light, but is that, do you feel like you get good starts that way? Uh, yeah, I think it does good enough. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather it be outside mm -hmm. and get them done under the sun. I uh, really have to watch it because they can get leggy pretty yeah. quickly. Um, and but, you probably have to be pretty careful during your hardening off process. Yeah. Right now it's not so big of a deal, but as we eke into the summer and those really hot days, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we put them under shade cloth and we really slowly baby them out. Okay. Yeah. Very neat. Well, I, I love the creativity and, and making do with what you got as you're building this farm out and appreciate you giving us a tour. It's really neat to see. So if people want to learn more about Red Fern Farm, where can they find you and follow your work? Yeah, Instagram is probably the best bet. It's at Redfern Farm VA. Awesome. Thanks for the tour. Yeah, thanks for coming.